Those of you that were here last night, you know that I'm 73 years old. So I decided that in giving this particular talk today, I was going to leave you with certain things to do. Now, the, my problem became the following. Given my age, I wasn't so sure that since I'm going to be speaking for a period of time, whether I should give you the suggestions at the beginning or the end. Because I wasn't sure if I could remember them by the time I got to the end of the speech. So I'm going to give you the suggestions at the beginning. That way, if I forget them, you'll have them. And then I'm going to go, it's sort of like a, a back type of thing. We start out at the beginning as to what can be done, and then I'll go through everything that will end up with that. Now, these are the suggestions out of the straight come on cold. First of all, many of you may or may not know that 90% of the judges in California receive illegal payments for counties. Surprise? Yes or no? No. No, <laughs> no means that you aren't surprised. <laughs> or no means that you didn't know. <laughs> Not surprised. Not surprised. How many of you didn't know? <clears throat> Most of the room. Okay. What happened was this. Starting in the mid-1980s, what occurred is, and I believe it started in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles County decided that it was going to pay the judges extra money. And the reason that they gave is they said that we want to attract and retain qualified judges to serve in Los Angeles County. That sounds very nice. There's a problem. The problem is, is that the judges are state elected constitutional officials. In other words, they don't work for Los Angeles County. They work for you. They work for the state. And if you look on your ballots, you'll see that you elect the Superior Court judges. So if LA County gives the judges money to attract them, they can't. Because you can't attract someone who has to run for an election. And if they give them money to retain them, they can't do that either. Because they have to run for re-election. What does the money come down to? A bribe. Straightforward and simple. And I'll get into all that later on. Here is the solution to get rid of that problem. You're a political group. I'm making the following suggestion. What you do is you go to your county board of supervisors, and there are 29 actually 30 counties that pay, make these payments. Go to your county board of supervisors and you say, stop the payments. Because whose money are they taking? They're taking money out of the general fund. But where does that money come from? That comes from your property taxes. So you're not only paying for these judges through your state taxes, they're now taking your property taxes and they're paid for the judges. So you go to the board of supervisors and you say, we want you to stop paying the money. Number one, you cut off the water. Number two, you go to them and you say, we want you to pass an ordinance that says any judge who received money from the county can't sit in the court for this county. Now, if they're an elected state judge, they may be able to sit somewhere else, but they can't sit in the county here. Real simple. Two real simple things. Courts don't get involved. Judges are screwed. <laughs> One, they don't get the money. Number two, they can't sit in the county because they got the money. I'm going to go into a lot of other things later on. Those are the two real simple things. And how do you get it accomplished? You put the pressure on the supervisors. And how do you put the pressure on the supervisors? Because of the fact that you elect them. And how do you do that? Because you can get out there and you can 
campaign against them. You can go in and show how much money they have paid out to these people. And you can go in and say, why do you want to reelect a supervisor that has paid all this money out? Which was illegal. I'll get into that later. Oh, got that out. Now, let's go into who am I? I am a 73 year old kid that was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and got lucky. I went to the University of Wisconsin undergrad. I then got lucky and got into the University of Chicago Law School. Now, as my daughter put it, I went to law school before Christ was born. <laughs> <laughs> Started out in 1961, graduated in 1964. That was an altogether different era. In 1964, as I was on my way into Naval Jag, the, uh, I got lucky again. And I got into the London School of Economics. And I was going to go there to do a master's in law with dissertation. My dissertation was going to be on common market antitrust law. The dissertation got wrong, and the school said to me, well, if you stay around another year, you can get a PhD. It wasn't quite that simple, but that's sort of the short end of the story. 1967, I was awarded a PhD subject of law, international law, and my thesis now became international and comparative law, antitrust law, or how to screw the other guy in 14 ways in international business. <laughs> to do that, I had to survey all the antitrust laws of the world, and then come up with a treaty. Did that. Now it was time to go to work. So there were two jobs that were open to me that I was interested in. One was with the United Nations, and the second one was to do antitrust work for the United States government. Well, the UN job that they offered me was in human rights. At that time, the son of the Aga Khan was handling human rights for the United Nations. You knew they weren't doing anything. <laughs> the United States government job was very, very interesting because I would then be chasing international cartels. They interviewed me in Paris. And the only reason I got the job, as I put it, is I was the only one that could order breakfast. So if they wanted to eat breakfast, they had to hire me. They ate breakfast, I got hired. Now, during this period of time, while I was doing these things, I also, being a poor kid out of Milwaukee, ended up getting a certificate of comparative law from the International University of Luxembourg. Uh, three certificates of comparative law and a higher diploma of comparative law from the International Faculty for the of Comparative Law in Strasbourg. And I traveled to every country in Europe with the exception of Romania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. This meant in 1966 I was in Poland, I was in Czechoslovakia, I was in Hungary, and I was in Russia. Now they had a little thing back then called the Iron Curtain. So when it came time, and I was going into the Foreign Commerce section of the Antitrust Division, which meant that I had to have a certain type of security clearance. It took the FBI and the CIA one year to go through and check everything out. In fact, the humorous aspect, close to the end of the year, I called the CIA in London. So they had an office there and call it, say, CIA. That's the CIA. I said, ah. <laughs> no. I'm Richard Fine, you're supposed to be checking me out, let's take this so long. The guy says, oh, we did it already, you know, we're finished. You know, I mean, that sort of a little bit boost back then. And anyway, they called me, and I, I went to work for an international law firm during the time that they were checking me out. Because I told the head of the international law firm, I said, look, either you can hire me or I can wash dishes. He said, well, we can't have you doing that, so we'll hire you. So I did all this international law work for a year. Government called me in the beginning of October of 1968, and they said, you have a week to get to Washington. Otherwise, you're going to lose a job. So I said goodbye to the law firm and went to Washington. And I started out in the Foreign Commerce Section of the Antitrust Division. First job that I have found, I'm 28 years old. Very first job that I have is to investigate the international pulp paper inducement cartel. Now, this was a cartel that existed across the world 
And what they do is they would meet in various places and they set the price for pulp paper and newsprint. And then based upon the world price, they would then, you know, that would then reflect the United States price. At 28 years old, I had the sheer joy of going through and fighting every major Wall Street firm. And the man who was the Attorney General under Eisenhower came down to negotiate a subpoena with me. I was so excited I called home. Because you know, the Attorney General was coming down you know, to negotiate a subpoena. So that was the start of my career. Um, we recommended an indictment. It went up to the White House. Nixon nixed it. And um, that was the end of that indictment. I was pissed off. They then gave me a choice to go after the National Football League you know, or General Motors in Ford. Now, take a look. Take a look at a football player. <laughs> you know I'm not going after a football player. <laughs> GM and Ford are just a couple of big corporations. Went after them. We indicted them. This time around, we got smart. We took the indictment, put it in a lockbox, and told the White House, here's the deal. <laughs> you guys try and stop this one. We let the grand jury run, and we go out to the press. GM and Ford got indicted. So after four years, you know, I left the Justice Department, and I was offered a job with a firm out in California. And they shipped me out to California. I ended up working for them for a year, and a, the head of another firm in California that had offered me a job came to me and said, look, Sam Yorty's uh, been defeated for mayor. Tom Bradley has become the mayor. Uh, there's been some problems with corruption in the Yorty administration. Uh, we were, the guy that's handling the investigation is good, but uh, he's lacking a certain amount of, shall we say, guts. Or not necessarily guts, but knowledge as to how to go in and really dig this stuff out. We want you to come in and become the special counsel of the Governmental Efficiency Committee and nail these guys. So I came into the city government and became the special counsel. We knocked off Yorty and some of his friends. And at the same time, I founded the first municipal antitrust division in the country. And I did that you know, for a year. And then after that, in 1974, opened up my own practice. And I started out a little office, 11 feet by 13 feet. And I hired a secretary. And the secretary and I bought her into this, an IBM Selectric. Remember the IBM Selectric? The secretary said, if you don't have work for me, you know, I'm not working to cost you anything. Anyway, uh, things went along, and some of the lawsuits that I got involved in was one of them, when you get to United Way, you designate where you want your money to go. That's because of the lawsuit that I brought. The man against me was Richard Reardon. 1.30 <laughs> in the morning, the day that we were going after the preliminary injunction, we settled the lawsuit, and that changed the entire way that United Way worked. Because before that point in time, you gave to United Way, and they decided where your money went. After that, that was 1979. After that point in time, you could give to United Way, you could tell them where you wanted the money to go. What United Way had done is that there was another organization called Associated Income Donors. They ultimately merged with United Way. And what happened is that United Way told all the charities that if they gave, if they took money from associated income donors, United Way wouldn't give them any money. A little anti-competitive. I was hired by AID to go after United Way, and that's how we nailed them. And that's how the whole charitable thing changed. Another lawsuit that I brought was the lawsuit against OPEC, because it turned out that this is remember in 1979 when all the, when the gas prices first went up. Yeah. Yeah, well. A group called the International Association of Machinists, who was the union for all the aircraft industry, got ticked off. 